Ah, once was a ship that put to sea. The name of the ship was the Bully of Tea. The winds blew up, a bow dipped down, a blow, my bully boys blow. Soon may the weller man come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tonguing is done, we'll take our leave and go. Are you sick of that one yet? I hope not. Because today I'm going to talk shanties, make grog, and also a cocktail that I put together in honor of that wellerman and her cargo of sugar, tea, and rum. So hold fast, me hearties. Hold fast, and I'll see you around the horn. I can't say hold fast and I'll see you around the horn without slipping into a pirate voice. It's impossible. <laughs> it's a physical impossibility. <laughs> So apparently, sea shanties are a thing right now on TikTok, so much so that the New York Times felt compelled to write an article about it, and it's mainly down to this Wellerman song. Nathan Evans, a TikToker, is that the proper nomenclature? Ticker? Talker? Ricky Ticky Tacky Taver? I'm gonna go with talker. Nathan Evans, a talker from Scotland, uh, just kind of broke through with his rendition of the Wellerman. Once was a ship that put to sea, the name of the ship was a bully of tea. And then talkers started layering their own harmonies and instruments onto it, and it's really, it's kind of amazing, honestly. Soon may the Wellerman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum. One day when the tongue is done, we'll take our leave and go. Uh, I'm not on TikTok, by the way, but should I be? Yeah, probably not. The thing about this Wellerman song is that it's got a chorus that, well, soon may the Wellerman come to bring us sugar and tea and rum and blah blah blah. And, and now sugar, tea, and rum, well, I gotta tell you, that is the foundation for a period-appropriate rum punch, actually. But I've kind of done punches along those lines on here already when I talked about double indemnity, for example, and when I did uh, Miss Patty's Founder's Day punch from Gilmore's Girls. Links below to both of those if you missed them. So I played around with that recipe as a punch a bit, uh, but I wanted to take it a step further into like proper cocktail territory. And I gotta say, I am, I'm very pleased with the results of those efforts. Uh, but first, I do think we should talk a little bit about shanties and grog. Right after this message from my sponsors. Hello friends, it's wine time again. You know, the thing about wine is that there is an awful lot of it out there. And the thing about me is that I am regularly paralyzed with decision fatigue. Do I want to open the bottle and drink the wine? Sure, of course I do. Do I want to get out of my house and put on a mask and brave the store and agonize over which bottles are the ones to buy? No, I do not. So instead I let Bright Sellers do it for me. You know, I popped over to their website and answered seven itty bitty questions about things I like. And then Bright Sellers took my answers and fed it into their wine computer and figured out the right wines for me. The best part is they got it right. I've been using Bright Sellers for a while now, and each time I taste a wine, I give it a rating on my account, and Bright Sellers has used that information to further tailor the bottles that they've selected me. But, you know, it's not like there have been any really wide misses either, so subtle adjustments. It's a subtle fine tuning. I just got this box of wine, and so let's uncork one and give it a try. Nihilist Wine Company. That's the one right off the top. You gotta take a little knife, you go around the top like a little sommelier. What kind of wine is this? Cabernet Sauvignon? Cabernet Sauvignon. Let's, uh, let's pour myself a glass and see how it is. I really like to aerate it with my pores, you know? Just like bubble it up, go crazy, boom. That's a good solid pour of wine. Uh, salut! I like this a lot. Ooh, some nice tannins in there. One of my favorite things about Bryce Ellis is these little cars that they include. It really appeals to my desire to know things. Uh, so let's see what they can tell me about this bottle. It pairs well with gourmet aged cheeses, decadent steak dinners, and anniversary celebrations. Yeah, that sounds about right. I know you're not supposed to put red with fish, but I don't, I don't care. I think this would go good with a nice salmon, like a cedar plank salmon as well. Right now, Bright Sellers is giving HED fans an exclusive deal. Half off of your first six bottle box and a free bonus bottle on top of that. And all you've got to do is click the link below and take the quiz to get started. So do that already. Back to you, Greg. That's so let's talk a little bit about shanties and grog because for one, People have been asking me to make grog for a really long time, actually. Um, and But for two, and more importantly, the Wellerman isn't a shanty. I'll come to the shanties in a moment for I needs me grog before I go a call in the hall. 
Now, I did an episode previously um, about a 1960s tiki drink called Navy Grog, and I thought I was quite clear in that episode that, quote, Navy Grog is a chain tiki bar recipe that has nothing to do with the grog that was served daily by the British Navy to its sailors from 1740 until 1970. But apparently I wasn't that clear, since I still get comments on that episode correcting me that my grog wasn't authentic. I know! It's not authentic grog! So we gotta talk a little bit about the history of grog. See, because from basically, as soon as folks started sailing long distances, like a ways out over the horizon from one continent to another, say from England to the Americas, ships had to carry casks of beer and wine because they had no ability to make salt water into fresh water while at sea, and their casks of fresh water would quickly turn to algae blooms and they needed to drink something. They could take that beer and wine and um, dilute it into their slimy algae water uh, to make the slimy algae water kind of drinkable, but the beer and wine also would only keep so long, and also, also took up quite a bit of the hold in its barrels. You had to have a lot of beer and wine for your sailors. The regulations of the British Navy prior to the invention of grog um, required that the ship have a gallon of beer for every sailor aboard for every day. That's a lot of, that's a lot of gallons that you have to keep on board your ship, and so they take up a lot of space, they weigh a lot, they slow the boat down, um, and, and again, they take up a lot of space. It's a lot of beer. But then in 1655, William Penn, father of the other William Penn, for whom Pennsylvania is named, conquered Jamaica, which had been a Spanish colony since 1494. And as a result, rum was introduced to England. I know, I find that a bit tough to swallow myself, actually, because I'm pretty sure that England had access to rum before all of this, but this is the information I've got. It's the best I've found. So let's go with this tale, even if it's a bit of a legend, okay? England now had a steady supply of rum, and rum had a huge advantage over the beer and wine because its alcohol content is highly concentrated. So you can carry the same water clarifying power in far fewer and smaller casks. It's like switching from Dawn to Dawn Ultra. Uh, it took a bit, though, for rum to go from being a thing savvy captains and pursers would stock to being an actual regulation of the British Navy. That came in 1731, and that regulation stated that a ship could swap their beer for rum at a ratio of a gallon of beer to a half a pint of undiluted rum. And that saves a ton of space and weight aboard the ship. Up until this time, a sailor was entitled to a gallon of beer a day to mix with their water. This was generally weak stuff, by the way, you know, three, maybe 6% beers, so far as I've read. Suddenly, the regulations said they could instead give the sailors a pint of straight rum every day. Oh boy. Think about, you know, there's a problem here, right? Um, and if that weren't enough, some of the more stalwart sailors who could stand to, to stave off a little bit there, some of those guys would uh, save up several days of their ration to really blow it out and have a party of it. It may surprise you to find that the result of this was really terrible for morale and decorum and safety and just like the general sobriety uh, of the crew. Time to go. Aye. Enter Admiral Edward Vernon, uh, known by the nickname Old Grog for the heavy grogrum cloak that he was fond of wearing. Old Eddie is a sharp fellow. And so he wrote into the regulations the following. The daily allowance of a half a pint of man is to be mixed with a quart of water to be mixed in one scuttled butt kept for that purpose and to be done upon deck and in the presence of the lieutenant of the watch who is to see that the men are not defrauded of their rum allowance. It is to be served in two servings, one in the morning and the other in the afternoon. The men that are good husbandsmen may from the savings of their salt provisions and bread purchase sugar and limes to make the water more palatable to them. <laughs> uh, from Admiral Vernon's official order of August 21, 1740, while aboard Her Majesty's ship Burford in the Port Royal Harbor. I, I can't believe that Burford is not a typo. And they named this watered rum for the beloved Admiral who foisted it upon them, Grog. Uh, in case you're wondering, a scuttlebutt is a barrel that's had one of its ends knocked open so you can use it like a big vat. Uh, he was concerned that sailors would think that they were going to get ripped off on their rum. This was a consideration in their compensation, after all. So he devised a system to ensure that they would not have to worry about it. Okay. The sugar and limes, those are just good sense. I will take a daiquiri over rum and water any day. There is this idea out there that grog was uh, specifically devised to prevent scurvy. That is not true. Because even though James Lynn figured out that vitamin C from citrus fruit would prevent scurvy as early as 1747, it didn't catch on at first. 
And even though sailors and ship's surgeons were putting two and two together that citrus works, classically trained doctors and the Navy at large thought that was superstition because everyone knows that disease is caused by miasma and an imbalance of the humors. In fact, the British Navy wasn't convinced that citrus cured scurvy at all until 1795, after a four-month voyage of the HMS Suffolk, which was returning from sea, with a crew that was miraculously free from scurvy, since the captain, Commodore Peter Rainier, had been a lemon man. Word traveled around the Navy, and by 1800 or thereabouts, the British Navy had a system in place to supply lemons and lemon juice to all of its sailors. So at least officially, those uh, limes and lemons, they had nothing to do with scurvy. So back to the grog at hand. Um, a pint is two quarts, and so then a half a pint of rum to a quart of water gives a ratio of one part rum to four parts water. So let's grab something strong and pot stilled and mix it with room temperature water and make up a bit of proper grog. And then since we are good husbandsmen, we'll season it with a bit of lime and sugar to see how that improves, okay? Um, I've got my grog mug right here. I'm going to add one ounce of a pot still rum, this uh, Jamaican Appleton Estate Reserve. You know, I think in the interest of science, we can go two ounces. And we'll need eight ounces of water. And there it is, my daily rum ration. Spits up. It's not bad. It's not good. Um, it just tastes um, a bit like woodsy water because you've really thinned out the flavor at this point, you know. I mean, that's good rum, too. It just tastes a bit like sugar that's been aged on oak, honestly. Easy, easy to drink. <sighs> I'm, I'm out of Smith & Cross. I think Smith & Cross would have been the better example here. Higher proof um, and also funky stuff, right? That's a shame. I have just enough, though. Should we do it? Should we use the last of my Smith and Cross to make some more possibly authentic grog? It seems like a worthy cause. All right. That means I won't have any for the close-up. We'll fake it with this. We'll backfill. Give me a second. I'll go get some Smith and Cross. All right. Um, away with this. Why is the rum always gone? A bit too refined for the men of the mast. Um, let's go with this phenomenal Smith and Cross. As you can see, that's what's left of it. it. Smells like butter. Oh, I love it. it. Smells like buttered popcorn. Okay, let's see what's left here. And one ounce, three quarters. So we require seven ounces of water for the ratio. And away we go. And there's our rum made with Smith & Cross, which I think is going to be more sufficiently and period appropriately piratey, if I may. Spirits up! Ooh, that's got a lot more body. That's way better, too. <laughs> I like that a lot more. So the Smith & Cross stands up to all that water. It's really thinned out, super drinkable. It definitely still has some, like, um, some fennels going on there. Fennel, you know, fennel, fennel, fennel flavors. It's got some of those flavors. It's got some chemical flavors. I think for a real effect, we should have, like, some real slimy algae encrusted water, but I don't want to do that. It is basically just the flavor of Smith & Cross with the volume turned all the way down. It's got just this very, very mild funkiness to it that kind of lingers with a little bit of um, slightly acrid, oaky, woodsy flavor. Maybe that's what it is, like some tannins, I think. A lot of times like a funkier rum has a late arriving banana rot note that comes up after the other parts of the flavor profile. But watered down like this, you kind of lose that. Let's try it with some sugar and lime. How much? I don't know. A knife. Just we'll squeeze a half, one lime half in there, right? What do you think? You think they just put the whole thing in? They freaking might. And then we'll throw in some sugar. How much sugar do you think you would have? I don't know. Maybe two spoonfuls. Just give that a good stir. Spirits up. Now we got something. Ooh, that's actually downright nice. It's, it's a little bit, the sweetness is not, it's not sweet yet. I mean, probably because most of that sugar's not even dissolved, so you're not even drinking it. But that little lime and that little bit of sweetness on there, just kind of, the whole thing kind of, uh, kind of almost comes together like a lemonade or something. I mean, it's, it's in that vein. Like, oh yeah, I like that on a hot day. And it would be, you know, room temperature like this. Uh, so you, you don't have ice, really, until you get to later on. And then, of course, it did, but 
Dang, yeah, but I kind of like that. The tank bad at all. So that's the grog. Um, let's talk about those shanties now. Shanties, shanties are work songs from the Age of Sail, sung for the purpose of coordinating the work of a team of sailors to a specific task aboard ship. Um, if you've ever worn a uniform and marched or run the cadence, you have sung a shanty. It's the same idea. Uh, we don't find the word shanty in print before 1869, so it's impossible to say when it fell into use before then, but a sailor's cant is slang, and it stands to reason that the term was in use for at least decades before it made it to the Lubbas papers. There is some disagreement, though, as to the etymology, because did it derive from the French chanta or the English chant? There's some big questions there that nobody cares about. Um, now, like cadences, which generally break down to marching and running cadences, shanties have categories too. Very broadly, there are pulling and capstan shanties, with pulling shanties having specific syllables that a crew of sailors working together would, um, working a line together would all pull on, and capstan shanties intended to get everyone's feet in step together as they march around the capstan to turn it. The capstan is that big winch that's on deck for hauling up the anchor, or possibly you could uh, attach your halyards to it and stuff like that. Pulling shanties further break down to both long haul and short haul shanties, um, a long haul involves hauling once per line, generally on the final syllable, short haul having two hauls per line. The heavy slow work, long haul, easier quick work, short haul. The capstan shanty is broken down into stamp and go shanties and the pump shanty, uh, as well as the capstan shanty general. A pump shanty was for working specifically bilge pumps. And then the stamp and go is this really specific thing that happens on huge boats with massive crews where a crew would line up in a big circle or loop on deck and march um, and a section, at a section of that circle, there would be a line or capstan to join in and haul or push, and then you'd move down the line and go around the loop on a rest, right? Sort of an expanded, open-ended capstan type job. And then there's foxel songs. The foxel, F-O apostrophe C apostrophe S-L-E, or forecastle in lubber speak, is the raised tower aboard the bow of an old galley and caravel, a forecastle is armed with archers in ye old days of yore. It was also where your sailors lived. It was where their crew quarters were. They slept. The sailors, not the officers. There was a difference between, like, you know, able-bodied seamen and officers. Kind of an enlisted and officer set. Uh, the name stuck, even though the structure was removed from the deck. Uh, and the foxhole would be referring to the sailors as a group or where they slept or just, like, the men of the ship, right? They were sung when not at work, when at rest. The foxhole is where they slept. These songs were just for fun. They had um, no work syllables on them. So what kind of a shanty is the Wellerman, you ask? Well, according to shanty expert Jerry Smythe of Liverpool, John Moore's University, it isn't. It is a song intended to be sung by a single singer and has no intended call and response. God have mercy upon the shantyman who's asked for a shanty and offers the Wellerman. Perhaps it was a foxhole song, though. Um, one other thing about shanties, they were mostly intended to be humorous, and they were filthy. <laughs> now, Victorian and Edwardian interest in folk music led to these songs being published in vulgarized form, highly cleaned up for public consumption. Basically, if you are now imagining a shanty that you know, and you think you'd be comfortable singing it in the presence of children, or really just decent, upstanding folk, very likely the lyrics you're thinking of are the boulderized version, or possibly you're not familiar with the meanings behind some of the colorful phrases. For an example of some properly filthy shanty work, look for the adult versions of Barnacle Bill the Sailor, also known as Bollocky Bill the Sailor, a foxhole song, by the way, in case you were wondering, that is Barnacle Bill was not for work. Now, here's an example of a long haul or long drag shanty called Blow the Man Down. Uh, he starts talking about a girl, and then he replaces the girl with a boat, but they're still talking about the girl, and she's ready to go. That's what the song's about, okay? <laughs> As I was walking down Paradise Street, way hey, and blow the man down, a pretty young damsel I chanced for to meet, way hey, and blow the man down, she was rounding the counter and bluffing the bow, way hey, and blow the man down, so I took in all sail and cried, way have enough now. Way hey and blow the man down. I hailed her in English. She answered me clear. Way hey and blow the man down. I'm from the Black Arrow, bound to Shakespeare. Way hey and blow the man down. So I tailed her my flipper and took her in tow. Way hey and blow the man down. And yardum to yardum, oh where did we go? Way hey and blow the man down. Okay, long haul 
shanty. One line, one pull per verse. Let's move on from Sea Shanty Town. All right, I mentioned at the top here that I had a cocktail in mind for that Wellerman song, and I do, and it's about damn time I make the thing. I mentioned that sugar, tea, and rum are actually the makings um, of a quality and period-appropriate rum punch, so I started from there. Uh, working from the Barbadian formula of one of sour, two of sweet, three of strong, four of weak, I quickly had uh, a couple of glasses of decent rum punches of various types in front of me using room temperature tea for the weak, actually, which would have been a common way to go. A demerara rum for the strong and a simple syrup for the sweet and lemon juice for the sour. My simple is two to one, and frankly, that rhyme probably refers to either cane juice or granulated sugar, so you gotta kind of, the, the sweet you gotta figure out on your own. You can't really go just go by two of sweet. I worked up a version of this with both oversteeped black tea, which was quite good, and a version with green tea, which lost the flavor pretty much completely of the tea. And why green tea? It actually never occurred to me, but I was reading some articles and research for this, and I saw that David Wondrich in Punch was saying that green tea makes an excellent punch and is appropriate, and that he has some uh, had a rough night drinking uh, gunpowder green tea punch. I liked that green tea idea, uh, though, and apparently it is period appropriate. Uh, certainly green tea existed before black tea, so it might even be more period appropriate. So as I was digging through my cabinet, looking through the teas that collect there, I stumbled upon some matcha, and I had an idea. By switching to matcha, I could ditch the four ounces of tea that were severely uh, diluting this cocktail and swap it for ice. And now we're basically looking at a cocktail. I shook that up, I tasted it. It was quite pleasing, but I knew it could be better. So I threw it back in the shaker and added an egg white and then I shook it again. And then we had it. I know that song does not mention egg white, but possets, flip, loggerheads, etc. All manner of drinks had eggs in them at that time and were very popular in taverns and amongst sailors, particularly uh, Flip. I am gonna go with it. I think that it's, yeah, a slight anachronism, but not that it was impossible. As a matter of fact, it, it could have been done. This is a cocktail I call the Wellerman. I shall need my shaker. Um, to that, we're gonna add one ounce of lemon juice. And an ounce of simple syrup. You know, that's how I made it last night when I was working this recipe out, but I gotta say, it was a touch sweet. So I'm gonna go with a half an ounce today and we will add more if it turns out that it's not sweet enough. I think that a half an ounce will be enough, but maybe not, we'll find out. It's, it's This is actually not a crazy idea. So we'll just do a half, half an ounce of simple syrup, but we'll, we can always add another half an ounce to the glass if that is under sweetened. I think a half an ounce will be fine. I haven't tried it yet. Two ounces of rum. And choice of rum is important here. Demerara, yes. Pot still, yes. Um, I think the Eldorado 8 is, it was fantastic in this. I mean, I would just go with the Eldorado 8 if you can get it. Um, it has a lot of character and just brings a heck of a lot of um, toasty, sugar, Demerara, oak flavors to this that are quite lovely. I need a goodly spoonful of matcha powder. I eyeballed it the other day, a heaping half a teaspoon kind of thing. I have really no idea how much that was. That's about, that's probably overkill, but it certainly did the trick. Yeah. Kind of like a, a full load of matcha for like a, you know, a glass of tea, if you were making a matcha tea. And now an egg white. Uh, so we got our egg white. <clears throat> our rum, our simple, our lemon, and our matcha in there. Let's dry shake that. Be careful with that because dry shaking is when your cocktail shaker really wants to pull apart on you. I'm gonna add some ice to this. One big ice cube. The other one we will crack. Strain that into a coupe or a sour glass. That's appropriate. I don't think it needs a garnish at all, to be honest. The green body and frothy head uh, that's going to develop and it'll separate and really develop like a thick head on it in just a second here. Um, really cool looking. Um, it's something that you're not going to see a ton of in cocktails. You could get fancy with a lime wheel, but uh, I think I'd prefer dusting of just the matcha on top, but you're already so green. I don't know. Maybe there's another way to do it. There's, there's plenty of matcha in there already. Uh, you know, what I might do is I'll treat it like a whiskey sour and I'll do some bitters dots and see what I can do for a design on the top here. Uh, Angostura, by the way, is both period and culturally appropriate for this drink. Let me see, can I do, I wonder if I could do like a skull and crossbones thing. That'd be a lot of work. 
I'll try it. it. Definitely worked. I can do that. We can make a skull and crossbones. That was my first go at it. It's not bad. I actually definitely think that looks like... I gotta take a picture of it. I think it looks like a skull and crossbones. And there it is. The Wellerman. Who comes with sugar tea and rum. Spirits up! Uh, just so you know that that was the... Uh, that was the call of the tot, supposedly, that when uh, they were serving the daily rum ration, the call that went around the ship was, Spirits up! And, uh, and the tot, that was your daily allowance. The black tot in 1970 was the very final rum ration, July 31. Ooh. Oh, I like that drink. The sour and the matcha really, the lemon and the matcha work really well together. It's a bit dry. I think that actually, maybe not a full ounce, but let's add another quarter of the simple, um, bring it back up to like halfway between where this is and where I had it the other day. Split the difference for an industry term. <laughs> if you've ever worked in media, um, again, yeah. It just rounds it out more. Now, the matcha comes through as a flavor. It's a little less bitter. It takes a little bit of the bitterness off, puts it more into a sour place. Cause it could, the matcha on its own can be a little too dry, a little too bitter, a little too earthy. But when you sweeten it up a little bit like this, instead of tasting like earth, like dirt, it starts to have like this woodsy, grassy sweetness. It's really nice. And that honestly, the whole thing works so well together. I love this drink. The, the lemon, the sour, the sweet, and the matcha all work really well together. And then underneath it all is like a base note because all those things, the sour, the sweet, the lemon, they're all kind of up here, I think. For me, just the way I experience flavor. And then the Demerara rum, the El Dorado 8 is like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like this almost low frequency oscillator. This is like running through the bottom of the flavor profile. And it brings like this toasty Demerara, a little bit of funk. There's a little bit of a kind of a chemical acridness from, you know, a little bit of that funky rum stuff, but this isn't that style of rum. So it's very muted. Um, it brings a little bit of um, caramel, toasty, some of the tannins from the oak are in there for sure. It's got like a toasted kind of Demerara sweetness thing going on without being very sweet because it's, it's not you know, sweetened, right? But, uh, but now, of course, this is sweetened. We've oh, kind of reawakened all those flavors that rely on sugar by adding simple syrup to this drink. Simple can be like a salt. You know, you need... You need certain things to taste other things. Certain foods, if you make them, are very bland. And then you add some salt, you, you don't make the food salty, you taste all the stuff that you put into it. Sugar can kind of do the same thing. You can put a bunch of things together and be like, oh, that's, that's something. And you add a little bit of sugar, not enough to make it sweet, which we haven't really quite done here, We're right on the edge. Um, and it doesn't turn it into candy, it just lets you find those flavors that are hidden in there. It turns them on. I don't know how else to explain it. Mm. Yeah, it gets better and better. It has such a wonderful mouthfeel. It's this very creamy texture married with a kind of drying, earthy, dry bitterness. Um, it's not overpowering. It is unique, very enjoyable experience. Like as an experience, the cocktail is really fun. The whole flavor combo of the rum, lemon, matcha, and sweetness kind of hit together on your first sip. Like a loud orchestra, just like boom, like an orchestra hit all at once. And then all the little pieces kind of filter out and do their their rides from there. It's, it's quite beautiful. Honestly, this is, I'm very proud of this drink. It's one of my favorite drinks I've ever made for the show. Honestly, I'm extremely pleased with the way this one turned up. Um, very proud of it. I hope that you will enjoy a Wellerman in the future and it's sugar tea and rum. I gotta say this episode came from a suggestion I got on Twitter from an account at uh, Krozik10, K-R-O-Z-E-K-10. -E I hope I'm not putting them on blast. Kyle Rosick. Doesn't happen that often that I take a suggestion just straight off the bat, but he it was a great idea and I hadn't considered it and I thought about it for a split second. I was like, well, that's a good idea for a cocktail actually. Let's do it. And if you wanna shout cocktail suggestions at me that I will 99% of the time ignore. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm at how to drink on Twitter. I'm also at how to drink on Instagram. If you like the show enough that you want to see some more of it, you want to see the parts of this episode that I couldn't use. And there's quite a few of them. Um, well then you might want to check out my Patreon at patreon.com slash how to drink 
behind the scenes. There's extended stuff. There's a Discord for patrons that we're all hanging out in all the time. It's a lot of fun. I'm in there quite a bit. If you want to interact with me live on camera, check out my Twitch. I'm on there all the time. I'm on Twitch constantly anymore. It's kind of an addiction of mine. I'm at twitch.tv slash Greg from HTD. I'm doing stuff from the bar. I'm playing video games. I'm hosting and running tabletop role-playing games on Tuesday nights at 9 p.m., for example. Thank you for watching HTD. I'm your host, Greg. You know what else you can do? Check out these other four episodes that are appearing around me as if by magic. Check them out. Oh, that's a favorite of mine. That's a good one. Have you seen this? This is a classic. Ooh. All kinds of had a drink for you. There once was a ship that put to sea. The name of the ship was the Bully of Tea. The wind blew out. The bow dipped down. Blow my billy boys, blow.